Good morning, good morning, good morning. Today we're going to interview Eric Crown from Crown's Crypto Cave. Now, this guy has a lot of experience as a trader in the traditional markets. He has been working as a market maker in traditional markets and now he's a day trader in crypto. He's actually trading for a living, which is quite exciting because so many people in this space make predictions, they show you their technical analysis, they make bold claims about where crypto is going, where Bitcoin is going, and then they have absolutely zero skin in the game. Now, this guy actually has a lot of skin in the game and we were talking about everything i mean it was really a pleasure to to collaborate with eric because we talk about where the bitcoin price is heading we talk about where the long-term potential of bitcoin is gonna be we're talking about manipulation in the crypto markets we're talking about market making why that's important we talk about so many different things it's really difficult for me to communicate to you in a few seconds how much value this video will contain but i assure you that you will learn a lot Follow Eric's YouTube channel. It was a pleasure collaborating. Let's get into the video, guys. Okay, Eric, welcome to the show. Today, we're going to discuss the markets. We're going to discuss the importance of market making, how it works. We're going to discuss where Bitcoin is going, where altcoins are going, and everything in between. Really, I don't know what we're, we're going to end up talking <laughs> about, but it's amazing to have you here. Eric, what's happening? You're in Finland right now, right? What is happening? Yeah, yeah. Hey, pleasure to meet you as well, Mr. Ivan, and pleasure to meet all the people here on the tech family. Yeah, hanging out in Finland right now. Uh, travel the world. Been traveling the world for the last, uh, Jesus, three uh, three, four years. And uh, right now in Helsinki, Finland, nice little backdrop behind me. If uh, Well, probably can't see it right now. But yeah, man, absolutely loving it right now. The uh, good old nature-y, holistic feeling of uh, Helsinki, Finland. Nice, nice. So you're in Scandinavia. I'm also mm -hmm. in Scandinavia. Let's talk about your past, first of all, because you, you've been involved in markets for a very long time. You have experience as, uh, as a market maker. Also, you have your own YouTube channel now. So kind of give us your, uh, your past and an overview of what has happened to, to you during the years. Okay, all right. Yeah, so for those of you who uh, who are new or new to me, I suppose, <laughs> my name is Eric Crown. I've been trading since, well, it's kind of a difficult question because really I started when I was quite young. When I was about 10 or 11, I started to go down to the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange with my father. So kind of like the nonsense answer is saying I started then. Of course not, but was a cleric for a while. Got used to the business and really fell in love with trading at that age because, you know, you go down to the floor of an exchange. It's all older folk. You're a young kid and they're acting like children. You know, it's an adult <laughs> playground. It, yeah, it's so much fun. It's electric. And uh, but sorry and to interrupt you. You mentioned Pacific yeah. Stock Exchange. Is that like on the on the west side you have? Yeah, that's like in San Francisco. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So. Yeah. So I'd spend my summers down there being a clerk for my father. And uh, then, you know, at the age of uh, at the ripe old age of 18, go off to college, waste some time there, do absolutely nothing that <laughs> really mattered in my life. But uh, fun experience. Nonetheless, studied economics, studied business, did all that stuff, even did pre-med for a little while. Um, eventually, after about six years of college, figured out that I uh, don't really want to be doing this anymore <laughs> and uh, went down, went back over to San Francisco and harassed one of my family's, uh, <laughs> harassed a family, a family friend, essentially, who I met through uh, my father, who was now on the floor of New York Stock Exchange, ARCA, trading options, essentially. He used to be a former options ma market maker. Then he got into actually creating the software on how to market make. So I'd harass him to basically, well, <laughs> teach me, essentially, in exchange, I'd do all of his dirty work. and. Uh, and he became my mentor for quite some time. Great guy, absolutely amazing experience. And uh, that put me around some of the best traders of which I met another mentor who took me under his wing. This guy had uh, about, uh, about, about 35 years plus experience at that, uh, at that point in time. He's getting on the older side. He'd seen everything at that point in time. And uh, I just felt so damn lucky to get in his good graces and get picked up by him. So he kind of took me under his wing, showed me, you know, showed me what he knows. And uh, it was just a massive learning experience the whole way through. Eventually got confident enough where he actually, he actually gave me, you know, some of his account to trade. And so I worked my way up from there, joined a prop shop, uh, took my Series 56, became a market maker authorized trader for uh, the better part of my 20s. And uh, then heard about cryptocurrencies from, uh, from <laughs> yeah, from a college friend. Um, I think in about 2015, 2016, obviously, funnily enough, we actually heard about it on the floor, Bitcoin, in 2012, 2011, uh, after, it after it first had that massive parabolic rise. Everyone was aware of it, um, but I didn't really put too much thought to it at that point in time. Uh, it wasn't until my friend hit me up later where I started to actually look at it, and uh, and, I've, and I realized, well, you can you can trade this. I mean, it, it, it trades quite well. It's It operates off the tentacles uh, almost better than the stock market in some ways. We can talk about that, absolutely, just because, you know, Bitcoin itself, there's there's no real fundamentals getting in the way of the tentacles, actually. Uh, you know, there's no dividends, there's no earnings, there's no CEO getting on CNBC and talking all sorts of <laughs> nonsense, wrecking everything. Yeah, and so it, it actually flowed quite well, similar to gold. 
So I really, really liked it in that sense. Started to get more and more interested in it. Uh, started to trade it loosely and then went full time about uh, uh, probably middle of 2017, I would say. And uh, haven't looked back ever since. Absolutely loving it. Just the uh, the autonomy that 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 trading Bitcoin gives you. Because uh, when I was trading traditional markets, you have to have all of these regulations. You have to have all of these. Uh, you, you have to have all these certificates, uh, which are really really hard tests. You're paying all these fees and, uh, and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, it's it you know it's a mess. And, um, and and even if you're independent, you still have to, you know, you're still kind of under some sort of uh, thumb, essentially, is what it feels like. Whereas cryptocurrency, you get in the game and uh, and it's just it, the, the world's at your feet right there. So, uh, but it I, also feels like it is the case for exchanges too. you look at BitMEX, no KYC, no nothing. <laughs> They're incorporated in Seychelles. Don't yeah. I, I mean, they, yeah. they don't give a duck about anything. It's really it's really interesting right. to see. But before we get into crypto, mm -hmm. you mentioned some uh, very important things, for example, that Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin markets are not affected by uh, by the actual demand for for it as a commodity. So right. can you expand on that? It's, it's pure technicals. There is no right. fundamentals getting in the way. So what do you mean by that? So, OK, so when I say that, I need to really separate the fundamentals in the way that uh, in the way that the general person understands it and fundamentals in the way that it actually means for trading. So fundamentals in the way that it means for trading, like real fundamentals are tangible type things like earnings reports, dividends, forwards, outlooks. You know, you're hearing like the conference calls, you're hearing about the CEO talking, whatever it might be, those sorts of very tra uh, trackable type things, you know, metrics, whereas people in cryptocurrency think that fundamentals means like. We have a good team and, you know, and and uh, the and what, you know, I even know most of these things don't have a working product. So it's hard to even get earnings to begin with, um, let alone anything, you know, you know, anything on top of that. So most of these things don't have fundamentals. Bitcoin especially is well, it's treated more as a currency, a commodity, in no a sense. It's it's actually more analogous to gold. Um, so tentacles are just a better way of pricing it right now. And those seems to, that that just seems to be the way that the market operators essentially, you know, move the markets off of. Uh, you see it in gold as well. You see it in silver and you see it in Bitcoin. I, I would imagine, though, that some of the altcoins, uh, the ones that are more centralized, I suppose, at some point in time, the ones that actually do pull through and, and are legitimate, they will have those sorts of earnings statements. So they will have like actual fundamentals to follow. But for right now, Bitcoin is the one that runs the market. Everything kind of follows it in some way, in some variation. And uh, he really sets a pace. So it's always best to just be watching Bitcoin. And the best way to watch Bitcoin right now has been off technicals. But look, here is where I'm a bit uh, skeptical. I have to yep. be a bit skeptical because I understand what you're saying, that there is no fundamentals, as you say, that there's no CEO that can come out mm. in the media or on Twitter and write some uh, some bad things that will affect the company or some, mm. you know, it's a kind of stupid things that can affect the company. In right. Bitcoin, there is no such thing. At the same time, you have whales, you have exchange manipulation, you have uh, a lot of people uh, tracing leverage and there's tra tracing leverage on platforms that, that gain uh, money when their traders lose money. Right. So... To me, it seems like there's so much incentive to manipulate the market. You know, a few percent up and down, people get liquida liquidated. You as a platform gain a lot of money. Or you as a whale, you put 100x one way, you manipulate the market uh, so you, 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 you come on top before because of right. your uh, position. Uh, so how do you view that? Can we really trust technicals? Because there are so many news that can come out and basically destroy all the models and all the analysis and all the indicators and everything else that technical analysis is built, built upon. Okay. okay, so there's multiple ways to take this. First things first. I think uh, you need to really consider where are these whales, so to speak, uh, where are they getting where are these get, where are they getting these sorts of things from? You know, how are they judging the movements? How are they putting their money to the market? Well, it's not just random, right? They're not just you know picking it all willy nilly. They're picking off of actual levels. And how do they do that? Usually technical analysis. When you're talking about news coming into the market, um, I would actually really push back on that statement. News is something that typically comes out after the fact to justify to the retailers and the masses. I saw this all the time in traditional markets where you'd see a move happen uh, in the you know early in the morning, and then you and then you turn on the CNBC you know a day later or or you know or at, or at night, and then it comes out you know this move happened because Trump said you know blah blah blah, right? What really actually happened, and the only reason why anything ever actually moves ever is because there's an imbalance of buyers and sellers. That's the only reason why anything ever happens. News is subjective, right? Your interpretation of news is complete, could be different than mine based upon our, our prior conditioning. So when it comes down to that sort of a thing, really have to consider that, um, you know, we're making us, you're kind of making an assumption there that isn't taking into account everyone's, uh, any, uh, you know, everyone's general perspective. 
So with tentacle analysis, I mean, I could also give the easy answer and say, well, it's been working for me for the, you know, for <laughs> as long as I've been doing it um, now. But here's the thing. And uh, and something that I think would be really interesting to talk about is uh, perhaps you also might be making the um, the miscalculation of 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 looking at tentacle analysis as a perfect science. It's not. It's 100 percent not. And I can tell you that after being around some of the best traders in the world. They're not perfect, man. I'm not a perfect trader. I'm also not the best trader in the world. But I've met some of the best traders in the world, and they are not perfect either. And they don't put pressure on themselves like that. And tentacle analysis is actually quite useful because it doesn't tell you that you're going to be 100% right. It actually, in the way that I use it, tells me when I'm going to be, when I'm going to be wrong. And from that, I can come up with statistic, statistical narratives that over time perpetuates uh, success. So there's not, you know, just because a tentacle suggests that this is definitely going to happen, doesn't mean it's going to definitely happen. But now you have something tangible to be going off of, tangible to map out over time. And from there, you can come up with a plan which, you know, you, you, know, you, 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 you can work out with the statistics. There is no certainty, there are only probabilities, mm -hmm. but yes, still, yeah. my point is, uh, maybe I, I can rephrase it as a question. So, mm -hmm. if you have a market such as Bitcoin, which is quite small, where we see big moves, is technical analysis more applicable to such a market, or is it more applicable to a market that is more mature, that is bigger, that is not as easily manipulated? So this is really my question. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So if you're making a relation between the two, yes, the one that is bigger is going to be, is, is probably going to play off it a little bit better. Like gold, for example, has a market cap of, of over 7 trillion. Bitcoin is not even a trillion, right? Not even for the whole crypto market cap. So in that way, gold, gold seems to play a little bit better with that. There's just more eyes on it and they're, you know, pretty much doing the same thing. Um, and uh, remind me of the second part of your question. Well, basically manipulation, because manipulation. you might you might you might yes. have the best indicators, and they're all showing one thing, but right. uh, obviously they cannot they they cannot see that some kind of manipulation is coming. Bosch trading when it comes to whales moving the markets, obviously it's, they're also based on technical analysis, as you say, but still right. the markets are easily moved. Right, right, right. Yes, one hundred percent. But that is shown up in Bitcoin's in Bitcoin's chart to begin with, right? That's why we're dealing with these huge massive numbers with massive swings. So it's all accounted for within those formulas. It still operates just different inputs essentially. So it's you know it's gonna be bigger numbers, it's gonna be more violent, it's gonna be more wild. That's why we love Bitcoin. It has these incredibly uh, opportunistic vol volatile moves. But <laughs> But, um, you know, that's also quite dangerous in a sense as well. Manipulation, though, is a little bit of a dirty word that I have a problem with because we're all market manipulators by the definition of it. Anytime that I put in, put an order into the order book, I'm quite literally manipulating the market because someone else might see that and then they make a decision off that, right? That is, that is manipulation. And we only consider that someone else is manipulating because they have more money, most likely. So it's always, you know, it's always like there's a bigger fish, right? And at the end of the day, we can't tell stories about whether price was manipulated or, or not. We can only, we can only tell what has actually gone in through the, through the recent trades list, not even the order book, but like the actual trades list, that is real. And anytime that something goes through there, that actually does represent, you know, real transactions. So it does give us a point to go off of. What do you call manipulation? What, what would you define as manipulation? If I place a big short, uh, <laughs> short position, mm -hmm. and then I uh, try to crash the market and, uh, uh, and gain a profit. On, uh, guys, 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 a quick interruption, a quick message from our sponsors, XCOX. You know how amazing it is when we get sponsors. And you understand that sponsors are very important to the channel because running a channel of this magnitude and upload frequency would be impossible without sponsors. XCOX is an amazing sponsor because they want to create a simple cryptocurrency exchange and this is something that you don't see a lot nowadays it is very difficult to even get approved on many exchanges you need to send in your kyc details for some reason it doesn't work you need to try again all in all it can take weeks for you to get accepted in the worst case scenario in the best case scenario of course it takes a day maybe a few hours but worst case it really can take a long time now this guy wants to solve it they also want to offer you a simple application where you can trade buy and sell cryptocurrencies and all in all understand that this is something that the cryptocurrency space really needs because so many people want to try crypto they want to try to trade but it just takes so much time to get started they need to go through so many obstacles there's so much friction and so this is something that xcox want to solve and they want to offer a better solution 
Another important thing to mention is the fact that they do have a giveaway. So they're giving away $1,000 worth of Bitcoin Cash to a random account if you register during June. And what you have to do is basically go to this website, you need to sign up, and then to be in the competition, you need to transfer a minimum of $20 into the account. So you need to fund your account with $20. And also you need to go to their Telegram and to their Twitter, which you can find in the description. All in all, guys, do not miss the opportunity. Thank you so much, XCOX, for sponsoring we're endlessly thankful now let's get back to action let's get back to the interview how how are you trying to crash the market well uh, let's say by putting uh, by putting cell walls by uh, by selling some of uh, of my Bitcoin for example and still it is still worth for me because I have right. leverage on the short but position let, let me just stop you right there this price action it's real yes it is yes yeah so there therefore everyone's seeing the same thing Yes, but uh, so m my question really is, how do you define manipulation? Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it's all everyone <clears throat> is a, a player in the market. So, so sh sh is yes. everything allowed? Is free free for all? Maybe maybe that is the case. That then it is fair. But how? Because you have experience in the traditional market. Mm -hmm. So. What would you say is called manipulation in traditional market that maybe is not called <laughs> manipulation in okay. the crypto markets? Right, right. So there's there's technically no such thing as manipulation in the crypto markets since we don't have regulatory agencies. One of the reasons why I kind of left is because, well, the SEC and FINRA are quite staunch with the way that they define manipulation and all sorts of rules which came out after 2008, which some are great, some are not so great for business. Um, you know, typically as rules go. So when it comes down to it in traditional markets, when we're talking about manipulation, we're talking about like legitimate criminal activities, like and uh, and which plenty go on. Don't get me wrong, plenty go on, and I've seen plenty of it. Um, but uh, let's say you know, uh, use an example from my past. Uh, I was trading Facebook one time, and uh, and I come in during the morning. I'm massively, uh, I'm massively short. I believe it was. And uh, sorry, no, I was massively long. I come mm -hmm. into the morning and uh, in some bank uh, basically uh, says, uh, or they, 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 they downgrade it. You know, it means nothing. It's just one of those silly things that people kind of play off of. You know, one of those things that just, you know, tends to move the marks, but usually doesn't mean all that much. And uh, later in the day, and so, sorry, and then so, you know, as soon as it opens, it's just straight down and I, and I lose big time. And mm -hmm. then I cover my positions, you know, as, you know, as, soon, as soon as it opens, as soon as I can, just, you know, like, like you should. And so by the end of the day, that same bank comes back out and they say, actually, we made a, we made a mistake here. Uh, we said uh. Facebook, it was actually <laughs> something else. And then Facebook goes right exactly to where I wanted it. So, you know, that is probably manipulation. When I see someone come into the pits, when I see a broker come into the pits and he says, hey, I want to, uh, I want to buy 100,000 uh, 100, lot puts um, well off the market, well out of the money. And then 10 minutes later, that same stock tanks like 20% and, and gets halted. I don't know what you call that, man, but it sounds like someone knew something that I didn't. And that's probably manipulation. Yes. But uh, in cryptocurrency, we don't have those rules. There's no regulatory agency that comes after you if you if, say, you put in a fake order on the order book. In traditional markets, while it's quite difficult to judge such things, there's technically rules against that. And you will get fined quite heavily for putting mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, fake orders that you don't intend to get filled, uh, just like you were talking about with with fake sell walls and stuff like that. Yes, that can be put in there, but there's no rules against it, really. And I think the bigger question is, how should we reason about it? Because as you say, uh, if it is part of the whole of the whole market, maybe it should be allowed or maybe it should not right. be allowed. So I think we're still discovering what is what is allowed, yeah. what is not allowed. And but yeah, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, and that, that's a great question. Because you have the crypto anarchists on one side who are saying no regulation, no nothing. We don't want anything from the former world involved in cryptocurrencies. I understand that. And then you have the other side who wants, we want backed, we want an ETF, we want, we want on every major US exchange. <laughs> and I understand that as well. Because I'm coming from it from, from being in both, in both scenarios. And I can see some great things from both scenarios and some really bad things from both scenarios. For example... Let's say you're on BitMEX. Let's say let's say you're doing whatever you whatever you want to do on BitMEX, um, and uh, and then they just decide to not have their they, they they just decide to have a slew of system overload, and you can't get a damn trade through for like five minutes, and you're just getting wrecked left, right, and center. Maybe you're even making money. Who do you go to at that point? Who do you go to at that point? No one's going to come and save you. That is your you you took you take the responsibility technically by being on the exchange. In traditional markets, if that happened, you'd be able to go to the exchange and say, "Hey, could you bust this trade? Uh, you know, it, it, you know, it's an obvious mess up by the exchange. Please fix this and uh, and make this right." And you also have fat finger protections if you know if, if say mm -hmm. say you enter in a bad order. 
they're going to come bust that up for you. They're going to give you some sort of a notice. Uh, in cryptocurrency land, we have nothing like that. I mean, you can do, you can technically do, I, uh, as far as I know, anything that you want, um, as long as it's within the exchange rules. And even they don't really follow their rules to begin with, uh, anyways. So let, let's talk more about market making because. In one way, it seems like market makers are such a big part of the crypto markets and the crypto ecosystems, and many people don't even realize it. When you talk to projects, for example, all of these IEOs, yep. I mean, the first thing they need to get in order is a market maker because uh, <laughs> because there, there will be no volume, there will be nobody taking the trades right. otherwise. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. What is a market maker, and how did you get? What did you do when you were a market maker? Okay, so market makers are essentially, in the most basic sense, just creating models of the market and then sending out to the world quotes for both bids and asks. So they're basically the ones who allow you to be able to trade with them, allow you to get into trades. They're offering the markets up, essentially. And if you ever put in a limit order, you're technically a maker yourself. If you see on BitMEX or Derivit or whatever it might be, where it says uh, you, you get a maker fee or a taker fee, the maker fee is you're essentially being a market maker in some sense. Now, a market maker is doing this constantly with, you know, across, all across the board based off of some model with some sort of technical edge on top of that. Now, myself, I was an options market maker on the floor of New York Stock Exchange Arca. So I was always playing the reverse conversion market. But the idea between options and, and just trading straight up spot, which technically Bitcoin does now have options as, uh, as well, I suppose, on Drift, mm. but doesn't trade all that much. Um, not enough to make a difference right now. But uh, but technically, the idea is the same. Market makers are just looking in, or just looking to lock in arbitrage, what's called arbitrage. So they're they're trying to find some sort of discrepancy between the bid and the ask on multiple or, or on the same or perhaps multiple different assets. And for the very sophisticated ones, on like you know thousands of different assets. Uh, do you know my friend's uh, firm who actually does do some market making in in, uh, in crypto uh, is doing all sorts of crazy things with like 200 coins at once, finding little finding little you know edges in there, and. Um, and that's it, it, it. But the idea is the same. You're just looking to lock in exactly at that moment, typically instantaneously and and you and direction direction independent. You do not care about direction as a market maker. You're only looking to, to pull in, you know, very small amounts, you know, a couple cents here, a couple cents there and, you know, do it 100 times, you know, in, in that kind of a thing. Maybe a little bit more than that, of course. But uh, you get the idea. So the market maker has actually got a really bad name. And for some reason in cryptocurrency, land, it's, it's become like some sort of a meme. It's, it's very strange where people think that market makers are legitimately like manipulating the underlying asset trying to get it to a certain price direction market makers don't don't care about that it's the market movers you know people with very deep pockets they care about something like that they you know they'll do stuff like but, that but, but market, eric yeah. i i think the the border is very very blurry in this case okay because in many cases what you do if you're a project you you want a market maker to and you give them money you want you want them to uh, to support the price and for example, if you have ah, a market, okay, okay. Uh, I know you where you're a, going with this. Yeah, you I have can a market this directly. Right, right. right. Um, so, okay, but, but okay. by the way, so before yeah. we get into that, let, let's just cover the basics. So, yep. what would happen in traditional markets if market makers would just go away? What, what would happen? What kind of function do they have? Oh, if any, you, uh, good luck buying or selling anything. You can't get filled if no one's quoting these things. Right. So, but why can't we just have a normal order book? You have buyers sellers meeting in an order book. Why is that not working? All right. So re the typical retailer, do you think that they can hold up a market? They can, man. They, uh, they, they, uh, they're typically playing with limited money. They don't have all that much. Markets would be screaming in both directions. Market makers are needed to provide the liquidity for both sides so that they can get their fills. And, and the business model of a market maker is this arbitrage. So I can yep. sell and then, uh, and then I have, uh, for example, another buyer uh, and I can make a small difference there. And that, that's exactly. the whole idea. Yeah. Yep. But couldn't you potentially uh, lose out? I mean, uh, couldn't, if you have a bad algorithm, I guess you can you can lose all your money as a market maker as well. You oh, only yeah. take the, you okay. only take the bad trades, for example. Yeah. So, so that could also <clears throat> So well, here's fir first things first. Uh, market makers are not just like this one entity, right? It's it, it refers to a, a ton of different people, all who are competing against each other. So I'm competing against the guy next to me. We had pits on the floor of New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange Arc, and everyone hated each other because you're competing against the guy next to you. You're gonna do something for one cent better because we're all whores, and that's gonna get you filled on you know ahead of him. So when people come out with these ideas that like market makers are manipulating, it's like you have to you have to really get a lot of people on board to to do this. And if just one person disagrees, if just one person wants to take another way, ru ruins the whole thing. But that does speak to your point with with like a very low mark cap alt. Absolutely. And I do agree with that. And I can actually speak a little bit even more in depth with that because I do know and uh, I 
I need, I need to see this in a way that doesn't come back to bite me in the ass. But <laughs> uh, I know a, I have a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend who also knows a friend who uh, <laughs> who might have had or dreamt of having a uh, an ICO on an exchange that 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 rhymes with finance. And when they came to that exchange to basically you know sign them up to have their token, their their highly esteemed, very altruistic token being listed on this uh, Finex exchange, um, they made a deal with that exchange allegedly. And that deal said, hey, our market, our, our exchange market makers will will provide you know specific amounts of liquidity, specific amounts of volume, specific price targets <laughs> in line with this. And when you're talking about a very low market cap altcoin, yeah, you can do that because you're you're probably the only market maker in, in the game anyways. And if you have just even a little bit more money than the next time, yeah, you probably can run it if you really wanted to. And I'm sure, and from what I hear, that's quite possible. When we're talking about real marks, when we're talking about something that has, you know, higher market cap, um, anything, out of, uh, I, can't, I don't know if I can say anything besides Bitcoin, maybe, maybe Ethereum, um, maybe Litecoin, uh, but even their, you know, their liquidity is pretty, pretty awful, man. Um, it, it would be extreme. It would be extremely hard to coordinate that sort of effort. But you know, lower market cap altcoins, especially when you start going to like two, page two or three on coin market cap. Forget it, man. Yeah, they can do whatever they want, and you see it on the charts on Binance too. Just, just fast or sorry, uh, rewind about a year, year and a half ago, and you'll see like patches of high volume, and then, and then it just drops off, and and the thing just starts floating, and then eventually massive, massive crash. Interesting. And this is also something that I think many people don't realize because the words are the same, market making and market making. But market making in crypto is completely different. And uh, I think many people also don't realize when you look at the big, also big coins such as XRP or, or, or Tron. From what yeah. I've been hearing is, I mean, one of the w reasons they are so successful is because they are very, very good at market making. They have, for, look at XRP, for example, they have so much experience in traditional markets and they're now bringing that into crypto. The same for Tron, but uh, th there you have more of a Chinese influence. And from from my sources, uh, th th that kind of business is very common on their traditional markets as well. They're not as regulated and not as developed. So what is your view just on the global uh, global cryptocurrency market right now with everything that is happening? I mean, you see uh, this low, lo low cap alt doing their uh, business with market making. You see, uh, you see uh, big exchanges potentially doing uh, watch trading. There was this Bitwise report that 95% yeah. of all exchange <laughs> volume is, is fake. Uh, I mean, what do oh, we yeah. make? Do, what do we make out of this? Will we even see an ETF when all of this is, <laughs> is happening? Yeah, that, that's, is that's completely a great question. That's a great question. It goes back to our conversation earlier. It's uh, well, do you want to be on the side of the crypto anarchist, or do you want to be on, like, or do you want to be on the other side? You know, on the exact opposite side, or do you want to be somewhere in the middle? You can see that there's some advantages of incorporating some things from the traditional world into our current uh, crypto ecosystem. That would be probably good for it. You know, a few rules here and there would probably be better for business overall. And and I think you kind of nailed it with that one, actually, ma'am. So, you know, and, and, and just going back to what you're saying, yeah, Tron and Ripple, they also have something else very much in common. They have great marketing, and that is something that they're phenomenal at. They know how <laughs> to present themselves well. They get onto the CNBCs, they tell their story. Everyone knows about them, right? What is happening in the markets now when it comes to the price, though? Uh, okay. Looking at Bitcoin, look, looking at alts, maybe we can start with Bitcoin, because I know on your YouTube channel, you talk a, lo a lot about the price and technical analysis. So yeah. we recently had this uh, huge, uh, you can say, bull rally since uh, 3K, 3.3K. Now we're at uh, 9K. Uh, we were at 9.3. So what does it tell you as, uh, as a, from a technical analysis perspective? Yeah, from a technical analysis perspective, and I'll start to share my screen over here. Yes. Um, let's see. Is that working now? Am I uh, am I shared? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, beautiful. See. Yeah. So everything that I look at, pretty much from a technical analysis standpoint and a fundamental standpoint, for as much as it, for as much as that you can give it. Which I did forget to mention. As far as fundamentals goes, you can make the argument that uh, mining would would kind of incorporate some of that. Although mining is going to be you're not all the bitcoins going to be mined. It's you know in, in like a hundred years or something like that. Yes. Anyways. Um, Everything basically says uh, bull, bull ahead, essentially. Does that mean that Bitcoin can't have very nasty pullbacks? Does that mean that Bitcoin can't have, you know, 30 to 40 percent uh, uh, violent downs? Of course, and it, and it will. That's just that's just Bitcoin and its lack of liquidity and uh, one of the reasons why we love it. So what I, what I kind of start with here is we'll go off the higher time frames, essentially. And, uh, and everything that I, uh, you know, everything that I want to see has basically happened. We have on the monthly, we have now our first higher high 
in the span of over a year and a half since uh, December of 2017. That's very important because, well, that's the first ingredient to creating an actual uptrend on a higher time frame. This is a monthly right here, which is the which is which is the general guidelines for just the general market direction. So. There, 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 uh, there, uh, there's a couple of major things here that I really like. First, we have our first higher high. Second, uh, we have cleared above this yellow 21 exponential moving average. That is a very important moving average for uh, for for long-term trend identification. Is the way that I kind of relate it. When I was when I was a market maker, when I was a professional trader, I would use this on the monthly to judge if a stock uh, was generally bullish or generally bearish. We had both. We had our first open and close above this yellow 21 uh, last month. You see our first close above right over here in April. Those were big. Those were big, big things for me. And you can see as soon as we cleared that yellow 21 expansion moon average and closed above it, the next one was off to the races. I mean, this was a candle of quite literally uh, 70 percent. These are things that I used to take long term, long term, uh, uh, what's it called? Long term positions of which I'm actually still holding a, a couple right over here. Um, from about 39.30 and then 51.50, all based off that. So there's tentacle, there, there's tentacle analysis actually working for you. We first cleared the the uh, the green 50 right over here, then the 21 right over here. Trades taken, trades held, and Bitcoin just moves onwards and upwards. Not only that, but we do see the monthly uh, presenting a lot of things from a tentacle standpoint. We see the monthly stokes back up and onwards. This did accurately call the bottom of 2014, 2015 as well, and the bullish, or sorry, not not the bottom, but the bullish momentum. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but the monthly RSI with my settings, and and both these things do have a little bit different settings. Uh, I did clear the exponential. This also did. This also did um, call the bullish momentum being gained in 2015 as well. So these things are very, 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 very important for long-term trend identification. And, so uh, looking yeah. looking back just a few a few weeks ago, uh, right. could you could, did you manage to to call the bottom at least the bottom we've seen uh, the bottom up right over here? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So no, I no. In the way that I trade, and again going back to that conversation of accepting imperfectness, I was actually uh, I was actually quite bearish in this region, but. As we saw, the tentacles told me to be a buyer, and I, like I said, I'm still holding this position right over here from about 39.30. Right. And that, and that's, and that's why technical analysis is is very, very useful, especially in Bitcoin. Once we cleared above this area right over here, that was your signal to be long. So no, I did not call the bottom. Um, in fact, I'll never call the bottom. I'll never call the top. Just like over here, I did not call the top. I called the top right over here when we put in this local high. That's where I got out of most of the market, right around about sixteen and a half thousand dollars. So technical analysis again is not going to be perfect. You're not going to get the ultimate high or the ultimate low, but you don't need to to make to make to make a living uh, at all. And that's one of the big things that I struggled with when I when I first started trading, man. Trying to be perfect will really, 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 really put you through some uh, tough times because you'll you'll find out very quickly that becoming perfect is uh, is just about impossible, and uh, <laughs> you'll experience some dark things trying to trying to follow down that path. Anyways, uh, back right. to the yeah, back onto the technicals. We have golden crosses. And uh, we have golden crosses on basically all time frames that I care about daily right over here. That's the green and the purple. And I'm using exponentials, uh, exponential moving averages, which are much more important for actual long term trend identification. Uh, we got the golden cross right over there. We have all lower periods trading above higher periods. You, you know that intuitively that that does tell you that the long term direction is up. Um, you know, we see that on the two day. We see it on the three day. All the same sort of things on the three day right over here. I want to take a, a, a more special precautionary in this one just because you see this white 200 simple moving average right here. That's again the 200 simple. Very, very important. And you do see that historically speaking, it has been a damn good indication of where we are in the overall market cycle. When Bitcoin lost it right over here in 2014, very bad. When it regained it right over here, very good. And it never even tested it again for like the, ne the next three, four years. And same thing right over here. We lose it right over here. Very bad. That was actually my, my impetus for taking a short at 6,300. Regain it right over here. That was my impetus for, well, it should have been my impetus for uh, for creating another long. Instead, I just held on to my long. So we have the golden cross on this time frame as well. We have the yellow 21 cross and above that. Everything's looking good from this sort of perspective. Not only that, but we do have something else that I do... Uh, 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 that I do tend to, uh, not a huge fan of it, but it does help get the long term trend. And uh, this is the super guppy. You do see that it's been pretty damn accurate for Bitcoin. When it, when it turns green, it stays green for a long time. When it turns red, it stays red for a long time. And uh, you see that we've actually just turned green once again, uh, quite recently, right over here uh, at the end of May. So, so you, you mentioned yeah. uh, moving averages, you mentioned golden crosses, right. you mentioned that uh, moving averages are crossing each other and that, that cr gives you a, a bullish indication. Right. Uh, and now you also uh, mentioned this final in indicator, which was, was, was a super, super what? Oh, that, that's a super guppy. It's actually just a what bunch is that? of 
different moving moving averages as well. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. and the thing is with the moving averages, um, a lot of people, for whatever reason, give them kind of a bad rap. But uh, I can tell you from firsthand experience that this is what the big market movers, this is what big hedge funds and uh, long term people are using to kind of judge um, the the uh, the overall health and the overall direction and how they're going to be putting their weight into the market. And those are the people who actually do move the markets. They have enough coin. Uh, well, literally in this case, uh, to to move the market. So when they put their orders in the order book, that's when that's when you know subject A on on crypto Reddit starts saying that sounds like manipulation because they've never seen <laughs> hundred million dollars going to the order book before. Well, those are the people who are doing it, and they are the ones who are going to move the market. Absolutely. Interesting. So what can go wrong? What kind of uh, resistance can we see? And uh, or, or is it just 100% clear to the next uh, all time high? What kind of uh, <laughs> what, what kind of levels do we need to keep an eye on? <laughs> right, right. So it, it's always a matter of perspective, right? And, um, it, it, and it's a matter of perspective, because, you know, you might be thinking more long term, I might be thinking more short term. In fact, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially a day trader, so I, so for the most part, I do think more short term. And uh, I would say, yeah, we have clear skies to 10,000. Um, you know, it's really not too much stopping it over here. But I do want to remind you that uh, I do believe that there's going to be a 30 to 40 percent pullback um, sometime, sometime in the next few months, most likely. That's going to be the next big buying opportunity for myself. Uh, but, you know, again, it's one of those things where, you know, when we talk about it while we're up trending right now, it's like, oh, yeah, no problem. You know, I'll, you know, I'll get to that when it comes when it actually happens. They're very violent. They're very scary. And uh, why do you say so? What kind of um, uh, information do you base that prediction on that? Probably we're going to see a pullback. Uh, yeah, 30, yeah. 40%. OK, so it's basically based off this. I have my own indicator here. It's called the jewel. Um, I spent a lot of money creating this one, uh -huh. and, it's been, uh, and it's been absolutely beautiful for me. And this indicator, if you back test it right here, there's a very specific setup that it shows. And when that setup happens, we typically get a 30 to 40 percent retracement, uh, depending upon a few different factors. And that setup is, if I kind of zoom on, out, zoom in on it, and uh, and pick out some examples, are when this light blue oscillator right here gets into this more critical zone, uh, marked off by the red uh, dotted trend lines, and we get red in the background, and then we get a negative slope on that light blue oscillator. If we get that, typically speaking, uh, th this one's a very special case. This was 60 to 70 percent retracement, but typically we get about 30 to 40 percent uh, retracement. So right here, from top to bottom, we had about you know 60 percent. That one a little bit of a farce, but let, let's go let's go to the one prior than that, and uh, we see an example right over here about 36 percent we see an example right over here about uh, 32 and a half percent we see an example right over here another 32 percent we see an example right over here another uh, this one was a little bit more 40 percent you get the idea and we can go all the way back to the genesis of bitcoin it's actually held true and right now my problem with what's going on right now is that i do think that bitcoin is bullish here i think that it actually does make some new highs probably surpasses 10,000 and you know does what does what bitcoin does best right but the problem is is that we're going to get a setup on this and this is typically how you get it with the light blue once it starts to find a lot of comfort within this more critical zone, it will at some point in time get into this more, you know, it, you know, into this territory that has set those mm -hmm. past prior moves up for very, 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 very nasty moves. And that's what I'm afraid of. So if Bitcoin does get picked up here, which I do think that it does just based off the current price action, uh, we will get marched up with which will imply new highs. But it's also going to imply a pretty nasty pullback uh, probably somewhere in the next like i don't know two months or three months time analysis is so, not something that i think can really be done to be honest so so, so you mentioned the fact that um, yeah. it, it looks bullish but if if we see higher prices your own indicator the jewel mm. as you call it it will enter into this danger zone right. but w what is it based on uh, what kind of uh, components is it based on on a high level yeah it's it's, it's man at at its genesis it was based on some things that were like more tangible but now it's it's had so many tweaks now i'm not really sure i could compare it with anything particular i'd say it's a conglomeration of many different oscillators and moving averages uh with a few different components baked in and uh in different weights on all of those different areas too so it's it's hard to really put a i don't even know what i'd call it at this point it's been we've been playing around with it for the past uh, year or so so it's kind of, you know, it's at this point, it's its own thing, I suppose. Uh, it's kind of lofty as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> it does feel that way. But yeah, um, as far as short term targets, 10,000 is, 10, is an obvious area that people are going to be looking at. There, there's no surprise there. I'm not saying anything crazy there. Uh, the next big point is going to be about 11,500. We're going to see this also kind of mirrored on our volume profile over here. But here's the thing, you know, when we do pick up the volume profile, we do notice more importantly that anywhere above, uh, especially 10,000, 
there is just nothing doing above there. And that is called low market acceptance. And when you have low market acceptance, you can really get some powerful rips, just like we ripped through on the way up over here. I mean, I mean I'm insane. sure that you remember that, this. That was yeah. insane. Yes, this yes, yes. was uh, <laughs> something I've never seen before. And I don't think I, I don't know if I'll ever see it again. That was incredible. That was uh, so damn impressive. Um, and, and I can see, you know, I can see why people still think that Bitcoin can, you know, can, can have these massive moves. And, and I do think that it's possible as well. But basically, that is a marker of just having a very low market acceptance in that area uh, because, well, you know, there, there's we're basically in price discovery at that point in time. I mean, we're, and we're also kind of in the lower the last echelons of a bull of a very FOMO driven uh, bull run attempt, which those things always go much more than you think it will. I can tell yeah, you that. And you feel a lot of FOMO already. Yeah. People think oh, they yeah. have lost the train already, but um, who knows really how high this bull market will go. And so th the way I understand it, you mentioned that on, in the previous bull run, mm -hmm. we did not have um, uh, any previous, we weren't uh, pre previously at those high prices, obviously, because right. the, the bull run of 2013 that ended in 2013 went only to 1K. And uh -huh. so everything above that is new territory. Now, until we reach 20K, it is not new territory because we've already been to 19K and, and, and back. So do right. you think that this time the path from 10K to 20K will be more slow because it's it's more i mean we have previous prices from from that uh, uh from that range so do you think that the markets will be kind of more mature more slow more more careful or do you think we'll ba blast through all the way to 20k again yeah so um yes i do think that it relatively it'll be a little bit more slow also just due to the fact that we have a higher market cap in general which implies that more people are in this market which implies that you have to chew through more people on the order book to you know force price action um, but I do want to bring up a, a, a few things here from a more long-term perspective to that point and just talk about the general area. And I'm putting on my drawing tools here and you see this dotted trend line down here with the red arrows pointed towards it. That's the Genesis trend line is what I refer to it as on Bitstamp. And you can see that when Bitcoin was below right over here in 2011 and 2012, it was, a, you know, it was, it, it was a good area to sell on and we were kind of like in an accumulation mode. When we broke out of it right over here, it was glory times for the next uh, few years. Bitcoin then, then, then does its thing, go, do, does a parabolic blow off top, comes back down in bases on the same trend line, right? Uh, an amazing buy. Then we do something right over here in 2018. We broke through it on that move down below 4,000, which which Bitcoin did accumulate uh, uh, below once again, just like we saw right over here in 2012 and 2013. Once Bitcoin broke out back above it, that was my big, big signal that something new was going on. We've really changed the overall uh, dynamic of the market. As soon as mm -hmm. we took out this area, also the 618 Fibonacci retracement, you see that we have based upon it and tested it multiple times. Now let's actually take this one step further and go over here to my BLX index, which uh, will go into something that I refer to as the matrix. And I just want to show that this is kind of unprecedented territory right now. And I'm going to bring up all these same, not the same trend lines, but uh, but similar trend lines right over here. These dotted trend lines, each and every one mm -hmm. represents a support trend line for a parabolic market cycle, each and every one in Bitcoin's history. Starting off with this one in 2010 and 2011, that gets broken in 2012, and that becomes our parabolic highs in 2013 and 2014 right over here. Then we create another support trend line for this next parabolic market cycle anchored in 2011 and 2012 that gets broken in 2014 2015 and becomes our parabolic highs of 2017 2018 mark cycle right over here then we create another support trend line for this past parabolic mark cycle the exact same one that we actually just looked at on that prior chart anchored well basically at the same points and we broke that right over here at uh, at 4000 but here's the thing just with the other ones we never saw bitcoin break back above those those territories whereas on this one we have bitcoin has mm. broken back above this so we do have something new going on from the macro perspective which is i, I don't really have i don't really have a full an explanation for it just yet not that i need to have one it's just it would tell us that this thing might be more bullish than i really you know first considered it's it, it's new territories what we're kind of getting into right now and uh, this would imply that you know uh, likely glory times as well. But uh, remember, I, I don't want to be Mr. Permable or anything like that. I want to be Mr. Uh, Mr. Opportunity and Mr. Hopefully, hopefully in some sense rational, even though yeah, yeah, Mr. Money. But uh, yeah, um, you know, I do think that we're gonna have some pretty nasty pullbacks here. So uh, do, you know, do understand that uh, Bitcoin's volatility, uh, while while glorious in some senses, can also be quite painful. So FOMOing in, doing all that kind of stuff, it's always best to plan out your stuff, you know, days in advance. Really, I mean, there's there's no reason not to, especially if uh, especially if you're a retailer you know, trading on the daily, weekly, you should know your trades well in advance. So how high do you think we can go in the next uh, bull run? <laughs> oh, there are so man. many opinions on this because, <laughs> so, I mean, wh wh one of the opinions I've heard is that the, the relative peaks, the relative uh -huh. all-time highs are decreasing. So yeah. 
you look at, for example, stock to flow and you look at how much the price deviates from the stock right. to flow price in the, in the bull market, it has been going down. So although in absolute terms, we were blasting through higher and higher and it looks like the bull markets are getting bigger and bigger in relative terms, they're not as big as before. So do you agree right. with that? Yeah, I do agree with that. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Um, you can't expect those. You, I mean, <laughs> you can't expect the same, the same percentage gains as you had back here. In yeah, yeah. <laughs> started as, you know, as you see right over here. And again, it, it goes back to that conversation of market maturity. We have more people in the market now. So things just move naturally slower. And so you can even see it over here. You know, all of these, you know, all of these lines get one degree less with each and every passing market cycle. So that's just the that's that's a very healthy thing of a maturing market over time. And at some point in time, what you really want to see happen on Bitcoin is you don't want to see these massive pair about blow off tops <laughs> what you want to see is something a little bit more sustainable right. like an S curve <laughs> you know something like that is kind of what you're going for on bitcoin and uh and and as far as you know like uh, predictions for how high this rally goes i have no clue and i'm not going to claim to know and for for a technical <laughs> analyst to, to claim that they know where this bull run is going to go is is absolutely silly and that's again what gives technical analysis a bad name that's not what technical analysis is about it's not a, it's not a crystal ball telling you you know exactly what's going to happen it's giving you uh it's giving you things to to make trades off of which the only thing that I can really come up with here is that this dotted trend line, the one that we broke through down over here and then broke back up above again, is something that I do believe is going to be a base for the for the years to come. So we can then go forwards in time and judge upon this, you know, at certain intervals, you know, let's just pick randomly uh, the beginning of 2020, right? Uh, the, the, the potential low would be about 12,500. If we go out another, you know, another year towards 2021, the potential low would be about 32,000. If we go out another year, you know, you, you, uh, you get how it goes. Does that mean that Bitcoin can't break below it? It can, absolutely, but that would also tell us that something new is going on and we're probably going to drop down much, much lower. There's, there's no talks of bull marks at that point. We're in, a, we're, we're in an obvious bear market, just like we were over here. But that's also, if you're a long-term investor, uh, a potential accumulation zone. Of course, it's not financial advice, not a financial advisor. But yeah. Nothing's financial advice, <laughs> of course. But uh, Eric, you, you mentioned that uh, time analysis is difficult. Uh, but yep. if you had to say something about the length of the bull market, what would you say? Will it will the bull bull, uh, bull and bear markets become shorter, shorter and shorter, or longer, longer and longer? Oh, longer. I'd say, I'd say longer. Yes. So um, both bull and bear, bear markets will become generally. Oh longer. yeah, yeah, and you and and you know that to be true, just because again we have we have more people in this market, so there's just more things to chew through on the order books. Uh, when we had 20, uh, 2014, 2015, this was this was obviously shorter than this guy right over here by actually just a small nominal amount, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's just one of those things. It's a sign of a maturing market and uh, should be welcomed. I mean, look at gold. Again, gold has a market cap of seven trillion, so it's much more it's much more mature in in terms of that. Um, and it's you know, if we just pulled a chart right right over here, you'll you, I mean, you'll immediately see that uh, gold's been in basically an accumulation phase, or maybe maybe not accumulation, but basically in a consolidationary phase for the past uh, five six years since 2013, right over here. Right. And that's right. that's that's. that's that's what you're looking at if and when Bitcoin potentially gets to a level like that. I'm not suggesting that it will, I'm not suggesting that it won't, but if it did get, you could expect something similar like this, where it's going to take a long time to shake people out. You have to, you know, it's, it's really, it's really a much more involved thing. When if, you, if we could actually, fa if we could actually rewind a little bit more, we would see that the market cycles were faster in the past. Yes. So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I was in the previous uh, bull, uh, bull market. Uh, I entered actually at the top because that is when everyone was talking about uh, crypto. It was in 2013. And then we had this crash to approximately, well, it went from 1K to approximately 200. And then we were in this boring time, 2015, 16, and then 17, right. everything returned. Yeah. So, you know, it was approximately four years from, from one all-time high to the next all-time high, from 1K to 20K. So it took almost four years. I, I'm I'm just trying to apply that time uh, time perspective to this uh, uh. to this bull bear cycle because we had the all time high in in late 2017. I mean, if you just take the old time frame, it would mean that the new all time high will be approximately four four years later in 2022. But you also say that it's going to be longer, so maybe it will be even longer than that. So what is your view on that? Just you know, the years is it this year, next year? When do you think we will see the new? parabolic move and new and new move to an all-time high if you had to guess obviously it's, it's difficult all right so when do we get to twenty thousand and one dollars um <laughs> again man i i you know i really don't know i'd say probably uh it'd probably be a talk of, con of consideration i would think probably in the next year and a half to two years but uh again i'm not basing this off, off of really anything 
um, right. that you know, it basically be doing the same the, so the same way that you've done it. Uh, the way that I look at it right now, as a trader, Bitcoin's bullish. I'm looking to be a buyer essentially on these major massive dips, and uh, really not you know no more complicated than that. Uh, you know, if it, you know if and when we do get to that next level. Well, I mean, we'll obviously have a greater idea once it gets closer. But uh, when I do look at the higher time frames, it does suggest it actually does suggest that we'd be getting there sooner rather than later. I mean, again, the uh, the monthly right over here, this this can rip if it wants to. And uh, if that happens, I mean, we could, <laughs> I don't even, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but probably within a year. Um, so, yeah, man, it's interesting. Yeah, it's it, it's one of those things. So I would not be beholden to that statement, and, and please do not take that as any sort of uh, real thought being put in that statement. It, it hasn't on my behalf. Uh, you know, I'm 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 certainly I'm just coming from this from the perspective as a trader. What, what about altcoins? Many people are waiting for mm. the alt season ah, the to alt start. Season. And uh, <laughs> and in one way, I understand it that maybe people will be more excited about altcoins once Bitcoin gets going, and people mm. think that altcoins will have even uh, even bigger upside. At the same time, I, I feel like people learn so much about altcoins in the last bull run, and it's it's gonna be very difficult to convince people that altcoins are valuable because just the excitement. <laughs> are you know, telling me that? Are you telling me that these things don't are, are worth anything? <laughs> What? Just the last <laughs> bull run, people were so excited about the old coins and people thought they're gonna revolutionize the world, which I think in many cases we will see a revolution with oh, the yeah. internet web. But you know, maybe it's 15 years away. Maybe it's 15 years away, right? So what yeah. is your view on that? Um, okay, so altcoins versus the dollar, the more legitimate ones, they're actually doing quite, they're, they're actually doing okay right now. But if you're plotting it versus Bitcoin, if you're trading altcoin versus Bitcoin, not going to probably not going to have a good time for a little bit of, for of, uh, for a little while here in fact i'm looking at a bitcoin dominance chart so this is the dominance of bitcoin's mark cap in comparison to every last little other uh s coin out there if you will mm -hmm. and when we look at this right here this chart is screaming bullish to me <laughs> if the dominance is about to go up then that just means that bitcoin's likely to outpace these guys to the upside if bitcoin outpaces them to the upside you're going to see uh, what's what's a good example here? Maybe uh, maybe this one. Uh, some some like this one just randomly comes to mind. Some like this, <laughs> just straight <laughs> down. And uh, and look, it's, only... I, it's not like I'm a Bitcoin maximalist 100, percent but I'm right, just right. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the situation. And the, while I think a lot of things are exciting in the altcoin space, the results are are simply not there. Now it's exciting to follow a lot of cool tech, absolutely. But yeah. I'm just wondering if because I think a lot of uh, of the fuel for the old season last time came from this hope in altcoins that you know next right. year they're gonna deliver this and they will change everything <laughs> how the internet maps. works <laughs> right the roadmap is gonna happen next next year i think yeah. it's ju just gonna be way more difficult and although we see interesting projects people are also way more realistic and they understand that okay it's, maybe it's gonna take five ten years because that is what know, we've yeah. seen an until now there i mean beanie babies were like 20 years ago and you still got people you know, <laughs> telling you that those are worth some. Uh, there's still people who think silver is going to go to the moon, man. It's, uh, it's, it's. You know, people become people become have like this weird gang-like mentality with with uh, with looking at altcoins. I feel like, um, and uh, it becomes like an identity. And when you have some like that, you can't really ever destroy it because you can't. I mean, you can't destroy an identity, right? So. You know, do I think that all coins are all coins not going to be as profitable this time around? Well, I'd say that this chart would suggest so. At least Bitcoin's about to take the spotlight for a while, but they will go up versus U.S. dollar. Um, even the less, e even the less uh, good ones, um, likely go up for versus U.S. dollar. And that is one of those things with the overall market cycle. A rising tide lifts all ships. So Bitcoin going up does actually benefit just about everything in this market. Um, as we saw at the end of 2017, and I'm sure that you saw your, you know, a crop of uh, of highly of highly esteemed coins as well in uh, in 2014, 2015 as well. Same thing there. You know, they fall off the market, and then we just get new ones, and those ones have new promises to to give everyone, and uh, people just get swept up in it because you know people see this, uh, or, or at least I feel a lot of people see this as some sort of a get rich quick scheme. Well, the problem is that if if it's if if it's ever a get rich quick scheme, it's that person doing it against you. Um, if if you know if you're reading the white paper as like a sales pitch it's probably not it's probably not good uh, and you know th that is why altcoins will never die because you can always yeah. make a new one it's very cheap you can make it in 20 minutes on ethereum like in five minutes yeah. even yeah and um, there will always be people who want to get rich uh, exchanges will always list them because they want mm. transaction fees coin market cap will list them because they want visitors and um, uh, that's why altcoins in my view will never die because it's, it's even in in this way it's even better than a penny stock because a penny stock can go out of business you know they can yeah. actually become better <laughs> 
bankrupt. <laughs> and altcoin can, they can never come back. <laughs> never thought I would heard those words uh, put together. But yes, you're 100% right, man. 100% right, Ivan. And uh, and you know I, you know I I think the general case for altcoins will 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 diminish over time. I think that people will catch up onto that, but they're never going to actually like truly die. And I think it'd be quite naive to say that they're all garbage. I mean, I'm sure that there's going to be some absolutely. incredibly yeah. successful ones. Uh, but do I know what they are? No, absolutely not. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think it'd be naive not uh, naive to say something like that. Uh, there's certainly going to be some very successful ones alongside you know likely likely some like Bitcoin and uh, and perhaps a few other ones that you've seen stand the test of time so far. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is happening with you right now, Eric? What is your goal? Do you have a YouTube channel? Why do you, why do you spend time on YouTube? What is your future uh, that you want to build for yourself? Yeah, man, that's, that's a great question. So yeah, I started this YouTube channel um, about a year ago, basically for quite a personal reason, man. It's kind of embarrassing, but uh, if I just stop sharing my screen right over here. Oh, did I stop sharing it? I'm not, I'm not quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're back. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I <laughs> started my YouTube channel really because I've been trading for a while on my own at that point in time. And uh, I got lonely. <laughs> I was really lonely. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my YouTube channel is called Crown's Crypto Cave. And I quite literally felt like I was living in a cave, man, just waking up, trading the day away. And it's, you know, you have no real social inter uh, interactions. And so, uh, you know, I'm coming from a more social environment from the floor, you know, you know, New York Stock Exchange, ARCA, and we have people around us all the time. And even though it could sometimes get quite tense, it was very nice to be able to bounce jokes off of other people. So started this. And future. also now, now you're in Finland. So good yeah. luck finding friends. <laughs> 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 oh, that is too damn true, and, and it's unfortunate that most people won't. Uh, most people won't won't understand that. But yeah, um, <laughs> if, if you're if you're ever wondering uh, what that statement means by Ivan, just just <laughs> try to speak to a try to speak to a Finnish person <laughs> on you know at like a bus stop, perhaps. Right. Um, right. Really, really nice people, though, but uh, not the most social of all time. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, creating this community was just kind of my way of, of getting in touch with people once again. And, uh, and you know, once I started creating it, you know, it's just people start coming around. And then I start meeting some damn cool people from they, they might not be great traders. Maybe I can help them in that way. But they're great at something that, you know, that uh, that I'm in need of. Like, uh, I mean, just recently, this guy was an expert international tax advisor. And it's like, oh, perfect. That's what, exactly what I need right now, dealing with the American government. So. You know, those sorts of things uh, really, you know, became like a self-perpetuating uh, prophecy, I suppose you could say, just because, you know, at first it just it just started off like a, as a small community thing. Now it's now it's like there's a gen there's it feels like we're going somewhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's just been a pleasure to meet everyone and, uh, and you know, and, and get in touch with di people from all different walks of life and learn their stories, learn, you know, learn something that they have because everyone has a unique story, man. Everyone has a unique story. I mean, shit, man. You know, when, uh, 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 I mean, I'm sure every I'm sure everyone listening has something cool to say. And we start to actually talk to someone. Those things start to talk. Those things start to come out, especially when, you know, you're in a, you're in a discord server and it's like 2 a.m. at night. And uh, and, and, you know, the marks just screaming and people are talking about, you know, their lives like that's that's really <laughs> compelling, man. It's something that you wouldn't really consider at first, but uh, has really been at the the sort of glue in the uh, in the overall fabric of my of my life currently. So that's why I love doing this, man. And, uh, you know, it's put me in cool people I'm in touch with cool people like you. I mean, it's. it's it's, it's been an absolute uh, an absolute blessing in a way awesome and so you trade for a living is that yep. is that correct yeah uh, how is that because as you say there's so much time in front of the computer yeah. I mean I also sit all the day in front of the computer right. but I'm just thinking how it must be psychologically difficult to just yeah. stare at the price and you read the news and <clears throat> you overanalyze like I heard this quote from Warren Buffett that he he said basically I lose money when I'm bored because then I start <laughs> making I start making trades oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> and man that you said it perfectly right there uh, trading one of the reasons why I absolutely love trading is because it's taught me a, a lot about myself actually uh, when you're in a fearful situation, when you're dealing with like legitimate adversity and you have to think on the fly and all that good stuff, you will learn exactly what you're mad out of and you're going to learn what you're deficient in as well. And then you can actually go and, 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 you know, build those areas up. And that's the very fulfilling part of doing this as a living is you can have actionable, uh, actionable and documentable, you know, metrics to be going off of to judge these things over time. And that's uh, one of the one of the best gifts ever, really, uh, to feel autonomous in that way. Or, or at least as much as you can, because you never truly get there. It's, it's a path of mastery, so you're never like you know 100% there, but but you're always on it, right? 
So yeah, man, you know, getting those sorts of situations. I mean, I, I've, one story that every trader has in common that I've met uh, from, uh, from all the professionals to myself included is we've all gone through incredibly difficult times uh, taking usually like a big loss, like a massive loss. Um, you know, myself uh, was was basically like a little bit after I started in traditional markets, thought I was good, thought I, thought I was, you know, I, I was indestructible because I had mentors who had been doing this for, for ages. And, uh, you know, what happens to me? I end up, I end up broke. I, I basically blew my account. And so what happened after that was the most powerful experience and what led me to where I am today because I had to kind of, you know, step, take a step back, stop crying on a couch, you know, that kind of stuff, man, because it, it is quite, uh, it's quite devastating when you lose all your money. Um, and, uh, and, and then kind of regroup. And at that point in time, my mentor came to me and he knew what was going on. And he basically just gave me some words of advice. He just said, Hey, I've gone through this as well. There's been, there's been a couple of days where I've lost a million dollars in just one day. It's devastating, but here's the thing. We all go through it and you will learn something from this. So if you can keep on following the process, following the path, you will only benefit from this. And I really took that to heart. And it, it was very difficult at the time. Don't get me wrong. It, it, took, it took a while. But uh, but at that point in time, I, I did something that I probably wouldn't recommend to other people to do. But I took out a massive loan from the bank, took out uh, basically maxed out all my credit cards and uh, funded funded another uh, another account. Also, also took a small loan from my father as well who wasn't in a position to lend me a loan at the time. And, uh, and I basically built up account after that with all the knowledge that I've gained from that massive failure telling me, Hey, you don't know what's going to happen in the market. You aren't better. You aren't, you, you aren't better. And you don't, you, you, you can't, the market's always going to be right. You can be wrong. The market's always going to be right. And don't fight that fact. And that's what, that's what I hadn't learned. So after that, I was able to incorporate that after, you know, fully digesting it. And then from there, uh, integrate it and well, be, be where I am today. And it was, it was actually quite nice to talk about this story just because uh, a little bit more recently or about, I guess it was last year now, time's flying, um, was able to actually repay my father back, uh, double, you know, double what he gave me, which was just, uh, it was a great, you know, coming, coming circle, full circle, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, that that sort of thing is just uh, what I love about trading as a living man and, and what it's taught me psychologically speaking. I don't read books on trading. I, I've read maybe one, hated it. It was it was not useful at all. Uh, I think experience, direct experience is much more useful. But what I do read a lot is books on psychology because you will need that mm, in trading. True. Learning technical analysis, learning, learning like the actual uh, fundamentals of trading, anyone can do it. Anyone can do it and it's quite easy. But dealing with the emotions that come when you're actually in a trade and judging all of that stuff, that's what trips a lot of people up. So I, I think many people have a basic understanding of technical analysis. They know moving average, they know yeah. candlestick formations, they can kind of see patterns, head and shoulders, bar this and that. So what is the next step? Because so many people know that and then they just, uh, uh, maybe they watch just people on YouTube. Maybe they watch you, Tone Way, someone else, and they never really become independent. And when you are right. not independent, I don't think you are really a trader. You're just following Absolutely. someone else. So what is the next step? Because obviously you cannot just, you cannot be this brilliant trader by using what everyone else is using and just following everyone. So Absolutely. how can you develop? Yeah, and, and that's a big thing that my channel is focused on. I'm not a signals guy. I don't want to be seen as a signals guy. I'll tell you all my positions. I'll show you literally, literally actually, like, like I've shown you here, um, and I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing, and I'll tell you why I'm doing it, but I'll also tell you this. This may or may not be applicable to you. We all have different preferences, so you don't want to follow me. And I'm also not perfect either. I'm going to take losses. You know, <laughs> It's going to happen. Um, so, the, so, so the way that I found, the path that I found best is to first model someone who you know is successful. Have them verify themselves in, in whatever way that you can do that, but make sure that they are successful. Follow them for a little while, and then over time, learn the learn learn the principles of what they of what's made them successful. Maybe not like the exact things that they do, and then over time, you're going to evolve into your own understanding after you have your own trials and tribulations, and then you'll come up with your own your own specific style style based upon your trading personality. So you know my my style now, while it was directly based off my mentors when I first began, is completely different. I mean he's he, I mean he he would trade the five minute chart, uh, which which I had a lot of fun doing as well. Don't get me wrong, but now if I look at a five minute chart on on bitcoin i might throw up you know it's not good so yeah man i'd say that that's you know that's that's probably the next step for most people but as far as like a more actionable type thing i suppose you could say is uh yeah you learn all the indicators you learn all the stuff you learn what works you learn what don't what doesn't work patterns in bitcoin perhaps uh <laughs> head and shoulders in bitcoins perhaps um and uh but the next big step for most people is risk management understanding that again this is a game of statistics statistical setups not of perfection so you will have to take losses and you have to know where those areas are on the price action that tell you that your idea is going to be wrong so you can judge what's you know, you right. know if, if this trade's worth staying in or not
And so you mentioned, for example, the five minute uh, minute chart and um, uh, and and, uh, and others. Uh, but but yeah. which chart do you do you normally use? What, what is your prefer preferred one? Yeah. So it depends what markets I'm trading. If it's uh, forex, I'll trade the, I'll trade the very low time frames, five to fifteen. Uh, traditional markets, same thing. Uh, but cryptocurrencies, uh, I found I found the most success and the most um, the most bang for buck. Uh, typically on the 12 hour to, to two day, actually. 12 hour right. daily and two day, uh, four hour, for some reason people think four hours like a small time frame on Bitcoin, it's not. <laughs> but uh, that's like the lowest that I'd use maybe for like a scalp perhaps. Um, but, uh, but but it seems to me that the best, you know, the best uh, interplay between those is about the 12 hour daily, two day and, and weekly of course, although the weekly is a right. little bit more slow. But so when you, when you say, for example, in traditional markets, you used uh, t 10 to 15 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, how do you compete with bots? How do you compete with automated tra right, uh, traders? Right. Because at the end of the day, you need to find an edge. So you sitting mm -hmm. at the computer, you, you your brain needs to process what you see. Right. I mean, that computer has already done that processing 100 times. So how do you reason about it? And what can you right. gain? So there's multiple answers to this. First thing is, first thing first, you don't compete with the high frequency guys. Um, second thing, second, I, I did have, when I was a market maker, I did have my own algo, did have my own bots doing my own work for me. And I was just kind of the trader behind making sure that everything, you know, goes through. But uh, you find your edge, as you said. And the high frequency guys, the very sophisticated guys, um, of which, you know, I know I, I, I know a few myself, they are playing a much different game. They're probably playing a game of high frequency trading and some sort of some sort of arbitrage within there. And they're basically just looking to lock in like literally not point not 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 one penny, you know, per trade, but do it 100,000 times in a second before anyone even sees it on another exchange. There's a race, uh, just as a fun fact, there's a race against time to be as fast as possible in like the six, you know, like six decimal places past zero, uh, you know, uh -huh. to be faster than <laughs> there. And what people do is like they, they, they try to set up their servers next to the, you know, next to the exchange servers. So uh, so everyone has their 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 computers remoted in from like New Jersey and in, uh, in America. And I think like if you're in uh, if you're using uh, BitMEX or BitMEX, as I like to say, uh, I think I think their servers are like in, in Ireland. But uh, but those guys are playing a different game. Right. They're not looking to capture direction. They're they're pretty much direction independent. They are trying to just lock in that arbitrage immediately, taking pretty much no risk. And, uh, and be in and out with extremely small amounts, but but many, 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 many times. Whereas I'm gonna be playing direction more often than not. When I was a market maker, not as much, although I did have the skills for technical analysis, so that did allow me to do a little bit more with that. Um, but nowadays I'm playing just, I'm, I'm doing just straight up direction or I'm playing with options to begin with. So options are a completely different rabbit hole. That's what I'm most comfortable with because well, I, I was an options maker for so long. Um, and, uh, and those, in the way that I like to say it, allow you to be wrong on spot. So I can jump into a trade, be wrong, and still make money with options. That's the beauty of them. It's completely different, uh, completely different thought process. So it's just about finding your edge, really. And right now, that's that's kind of the beauty of cryptocurrency land is there's not that many eyes on it compared to traditional markets. You don't you don't have like the super super souped up uh, you know prop shop group who's paying develop like world class developers, world class mathematicians, all these guys uh, millions of dollars a year plus uh, you know just to kind of sit there work on your algo and make sure it's as good as possible so that they can go mess with the, you know, uh, mess with the firm next door. That's, you don't want to play against those guys. You're going to lose <laughs> unless, unless you're one of the, you know, unless, unless you're one of those guys. And so what would your advice be for new people? Let's say they have, you know, a few thousand to, to play with this, to just learn. Should they go to BitMEX? Should they use uh, leverage, no leverage? <laughs> should, what should they do? Be, Ivan. B b b what is <laughs> Can't say those words, man. Um, I, if, if, if you're just starting out, if you're just, uh, if you just want to learn, don't don't put any money at risk. You can trade on test. You can trade on testnet. You can do a paper trade. It'll operate the same. Yes, your yes, the emotional impact of it will be different. But you don't you don't need to worry about that right now. Don't listen to the people trying to trying to swindle you into like trading right from the get go, putting real money at risk. There's no reason to. There's absolutely no reason to. And uh, and you're gonna learn a lot just by watching things operate in real time. What does it feel like to put in an order, especially on some like if you do go happen to trade on BitMEX, what is it like on there? It's very difficult to get it in. Um, but uh, you know, you get my point. You get used to it over time. So you know, if you are newer, take it slow. There's no rush. The market is an endless stream of opportunity, and uh, it ain't going anywhere. 
So use fake money. Where can you do that? What What, what is your favorite yeah. um, platform? Uh, Deribit, actually. I love Deribit. Deribit's probably my favorite one right now for uh, for cryptocurrency. You can just you can actually trade uh, options there too and futures for Bitcoin and uh, and I believe Ethereum as well. Uh, and they also have a test net. So I think you just type in like test net Deribit on Google and uh, and it'll be, it, you can sign up for an account there. You'll be able to basically trade without any real risk. So what is your view on leverage? Because I can understand why it. It could make sense if you do like 2x, maybe you do 5x, mm -hmm. then 100x, of course, is more gambling <laughs> because the price moves 0.5% in the wrong direction. You lost 100% of your money. So that is gambling. And I understand why BitMEX has it because that is yeah. where most of the money is made. But still, do yeah. you agree that, uh, you know, 2x, maybe 5x still can make sense if you can risk manage it and you can make sense of it? Right. Yeah. So leverage leverage is a tool that that is very, very powerful if you know how to use it. However, the way that most people think of it is exactly, as you said, as a gambling tool. Most people are just trying to gamble with these sorts of things because it's easier to go on BitMEX than, uh, than say, Vegas, right? It's far away. Um, so... What, what are my thoughts of that? I, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I mean, people who choose their leverage from like a slider that goes from zero to 100 is <laughs> so insane. That is so insane to me that you can do that, uh, especially with Bitcoin's already volatile moves. I mean, all the way up to 100, 100x, 100x. <laughs> That's insane, man. Um, you shouldn't need any leverage. <laughs> Ideally, you shouldn't need any leverage. Um, but uh, uh, but it is a tool, and that's something that I uh, uh, that I set out to do on my main account, or sorry, not on my main account, but on my on my YouTube account, where I had a, what I called a streamer account. I started it like last year in April, and and I started with a very small amount, like it was like some like 500 bucks when Bitcoin was around nine thousand dollars. It was some like not point not uh, for to Bitcoin at the time, and uh, and I wanted to show how to use high leverage in a more professional way with a little bit of welcome on my side and build it up over time. And over the past year, I've shown on video building that account up from, from, from that amount now to it's, it's well, it's, it's, it's past 20 Bitcoins, whatever it is. Um, mm, wow. So yeah, and, and the thing is, is that yes, it can be very powerful if you know how to use it. If you don't treat it as a gambling tool, absolutely, it can be a massive, massive leg up. But the difference between getting wrecked and the difference between uh, making money, it, that's a that's a very thin edge right there. So it does take it, it did take a long time. It took me uh, took me over a year. But I really wanted to show how you can use that leverage over a long period of time. Wait for the big trade setups. You you know use those higher time frames. Yes, it's boring. Yes, it's not sexy. But at the end of the day, you know you know could you be a little bit patient if you know if you saw that as a result? Probably. Ho hopefully at least. So some people say that the the bear market is not over. We're gonna go to 1K. You see tone waves. You see uh, other people in his uh, uh, in his uh, sphere also saying that. Yeah. So. Uh, do you agree or do you not agree? Because I, I had him on the channel a few times. He's a very nice guy and he, he explained his thoughts. So uh, obviously he he's using his own models. Right. I, I know that you trade for a living. He said himself that he doesn't trade for a living. Mm. So w w what is your view on those opinions? Do you see any validity in them or, or are they just completely wrong? And why do you think they are wrong? What, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of wrong data do they have that you, that you don't have? Right. So, um, well, I'd want to see what they're seeing, but... Uh, Every, from everything that I look at, as I said before, uh, there's no reason to be bearish here. Uh, do we have nasty pullbacks? Yes, very, very likely, extremely likely. In fact, to say it's 99.9% gonna, gonna happen. However, do I think that Bitcoin's gonna go to new lows or even come back down to 3,000 from here? Extremely unlikely uh, anytime soon. Everything that I look at from a longer term perspective, especially with the moving averages, especially even with the fundamentals of which uh, we could bring up a few right now, I suppose. Um, l uh, let me just go back to the share screen. And uh, whoops, I don't think I'm doing it there. Let's see, just one second. Ha, I'm new to Skype. No stress, no there stress, we go. no stress. Alrighty. Yeah, so um, even the fundamentals also suggesting a major low. This is your Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin miners revenue. Uh, this, this, this chart represents Bitcoin miners revenue. So it's a fundamental chart in a way, or at least the closest thing that I can really come to on a fundamentals. And uh, you see over here, if we actually just do a little bit of very basic technical analysis, we're going to come up with something. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and put on my trend lines here. But basically, each and every one of these trend lines represents the top of a parabolic run. And then that becomes the bottom of your next cycle, right? So this one right over here becomes the lows right over here. This high right over here becomes the lows right over here. This high right over here becomes the lows of our current cycle, right? Well, mm. If we actually match this up with price action, uh, let's do Bitcoin USD, maybe on, uh, I guess we need to do BLX, huh? Yeah, let's do BLX. Um, and if, if we match these up and put on a Bitcoin chart in the background, hey, what's going on here? That's, uh, that doesn't look right to me. Let me, uh, oh, sorry, that's, that's, that's the wrong one. Uh, there we go. Just one second. And uh, we're going to overlay a chart of Bitcoin in the background. 
uh, using Bitstamp. It's represented by this uh, by, by this uh, cyan uh, line chart, essentially. And you do see, if we put this on logarithmic scale, that uh, these areas accurately match up with the bottoms on price action. So this area mm -hmm. right over here getting retested, boom, that's your low right. That's your low right over there. This area right over here getting retested, that's your lows of 2014, 2015. And what do we have so far right over here on this area getting tested? It's currently our lows right over here. Interesting. So, Interesting. That would be a nice fundamental thing. That's probably the closest thing that I can really come to from a fundamental perspective on uh, on the low. We also have price models right over here. So this is using a bunch of different metrics, uh, typically uh, basically uh, focused around uh, different market cap metrics and also the MBT signal, which is the network transaction value. Um, and uh, and this guy over time has been a pretty damn good indication of where we are as well. When you see all these guys converge on each other, that typically calls the lows, like right over here, right over here, and now we do have this going up right over here as well. In fact, not only have they not, a, not only have they converged on each other, but they're actually having an ups an upward slope. So that to me is quite powerful. And and you know as we looked at on price action back on over here, I mean just fr from my perspective. Uh, as soon as Bitcoin got back above that 21 exponential on the uh, on the monthly, that was my you know uh, uh, that was my more aggressive way of saying nope, this is uh, lo uh, lows are in, we're not going down anytime soon. Uh, so these things matter the most to me, and uh, and, and you know I'm, you know I'm I'm happy to uh, to respectfully disagree with Mr. Tone, but uh, I don't really see what he's seeing. Very interesting, very interesting, Eric. Well, uh, I learned a lot from this interview. Thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, guys, check out Eric's channel in the description. Uh, so any final words before we wrap this interview up, Eric? Hey, I just want to say massive pleasure to meet you, Ivan, and massive pleasure to meet everyone else here. I uh, would love to have you guys on my channel. And, uh, and of course, do you want to wish you well? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Have a good day. Have a good day.